Perhaps no single artist has had a greater impact on how we imagine alien life than Wayne Barlow. Widely considered the father of modern speculative biology, Barlow has worked for decades as a creature designer for everything from Avatar to Pacific Rim. Yet perhaps Barlow's most monumental alien world comes from his legendary book Expedition which depicts an extraterrestrial ecosystem with so much originality and detail that reading it truly feels like getting lost on another planet. The book was even made into a TV special for the Discovery Channel called Alien Planet, which was honestly one of my favorite things to watch as a kid. The world at the center of the book and documentary, called Darwin 4, is one I've wanted to document myself for a long time. So, for this entry into the archive, we'll take a deep dive into the biology and ecosystems of Barlow's one-of-a-kind planet. In honor of the book's logbook-style storytelling, this entry will be told as a first-hand account of an expedition across Darwin 4's surface. And if you find the planet as incredible as I do, I've got links below where you can purchase Barlow's book and support his work. Now let's begin our expedition. My story begins with this single, blurry photo taken by a faster-than-light probe exploring the far reaches of the galaxy. The image shows alien life is present in the fourth planet of the distant Darwinian system. But what kind of life form is this alien? How large is it? And what other life forms might it coexist with? There's only one way to find out. After a journey of many light years, I arrive at Darwin 4. From orbit, my first scans indicate the planet is a dry, hothouse world. The only visible body of water is a peculiar purple ocean of unknown properties. Scans also indicate Darwin 4 possesses an oxygen-rich atmosphere and less than two-thirds Earth gravity, meaning life on Darwin 4 may well be gigantic. I'll have to proceed carefully. Touching down in the northern hemisphere, I find a sweeping grassland dominated by titanic plant structures called gourd trees. Nearly 15 stories high, these trees stand on a matrix of root-like stilts. If these are the plants of this world, the animals might be true titans. Not far from the grove, something is squatting low to the ground. Consulting the field guide of an explorer who came before me, I identify this creature as an arrow tongue. While it doesn't appear to have eyes, a series of low clicks tells me it can see with an organic sonar system, and likely knows I'm here. Rearing up to its full height, the arrow tongue reveals it's a T-Rex-sized apex predator. Unlike all top Earth predators, however, the arrow tongue doesn't possess jaws. Instead, it feeds with a straw-like appendage on its mouth which is common among all liquivores, a group of tube-mouthed predators that includes the arrow tongue. And this arrow tongue seems hungry. But not for me. The preferred food of an arrow tongue are the gyro sprinters, herbivores with highly unusual body plans. While they spend much of their time resting, they're the fastest of all land animals on Darwin 4. Yet the gyro sprinter's ability to careen across the grassland at incredible speeds is a tricky thing, considering they only have two legs. To keep balance, they possess a set of hyperdeveloped haltiers club-shaped organs which earth animals like crane flies use to keep their bodies stabilized during motion. A key trait for the gyro sprinter, which must always be ready to flee. Speaking of which, I think it's best I leave these two to the chase. Not far from this unfolding drama, I spot a leathery rayback trotting across the grassland. A smaller relative of the colossal arrow tongue, the quick, solitary raybacks are in many ways the cheetahs of this alien savanna. Yet the Rayback's most notable features, their exaggerated dorsal spires, are something of a biological enigma. If we look at Earth animals for clues as to the function of these spines, we find some chameleons possess similar bony ridges to appear larger from the side and to intimidate rivals. It's a curious strategy, but if it works for the chameleon, it's certainly possible it would work on Darwin 4 for the Rayback. Traveling northwards, I'm lucky enough to glimpse a mighty hunter standing triumphant over its latest quarry. This ambush predator is called a prairie ram, and true to its name, this particular liquivore hunts by ramming its prey with its pointed skull. While no earth predators hunt in quite the same way, some species have evolved to ram into each other in territorial displays. 
In particular, bighorn sheep have evolved skulls and horns that can absorb tremendous concussive force thanks to their internal structure. We can theorize that the interior of the prairie ram skull likely has a similar makeup. At the edge of the grasslands, I watch a duo of mid-sized herbivores, called prismalopes, graze in the shade of a curious tree. But it's not the prismalopes I'm focused on. Upon closer inspection, the apparent tree behind them doesn't seem to be a plant at all. This is a butcher tree, a life form with a deadly secret. Its scent lures in herbivores, and when one gets close, the butcher tree spears it with its branch daggers. Scans confirm this life form is closer to animal than plant. I better keep my distance. Night is now falling on Darwin 4, and in the darkness, the prongheads stalk the savanna. These well-muscled pack hunters are the wolves of Darwin 4, and move with surprising speed. Cresting a hill, I see what they're hunting. The gyro sprinter from earlier survived the chase with the arrow tongue, but is now in even more danger. Racing across the plains, the gyro sprinter is incredibly fast, but the prongheads have the numbers advantage. Unlike the arrow tongue, they can coordinate in a pack to cut off their prey. But this gyro sprinter is a survivor, and manages to give them the slip. On Darwin 4, it pays to be the quickest. With the morning now just a few hours away, I've made a significant discovery. I've followed a lone rayback beyond the savanna to the edge of a mysterious forest. This new environment might be home to all manner of distinct life forms, but the only way to know for sure is to venture deeper. I don't have to go far. On the periphery of the forest, a huge creature shakes the ground, so tall that it towers over the trees. This is a groveback, one of the largest species native to Darwin 4. Strange tree-like structures grow from its back, which might help the groveback remain camouflaged while it slumbers. Given the groveback's size, however, it seems unlikely this creature would fear any predator. Instead, as the sun rises, I wonder if perhaps the groveback has a symbiotic relationship with the plants on its back, gaining energy from their photosynthesis much like an earth leaf sheep, a rare type of sea slug that almost looks like a miniature groveback from certain angles. In any case, the grovebacks are truly awe-inspiring. I'll have to make sure they don't step on me, though. Deeper into the forest, I spot a curious life form reclining on a branch far above me. This is a dagger wrist, an agile, arboreal predator that rules the upper treetops thanks to its deadly, bladed proboscis, which is the closest thing to a functioning jaw on Darwin 4. In a burst of speed, the dagger wrist leaps to another tree, scaling the side of the trunk by using the claw-like arms that are its namesake almost like climbing spikes. And in the canopy, the dagger wrist rejoins a troop of its own kind. This family unit is composed of a young infant and two parents, and their pack behavior showcases a new side to Darwin life, social interaction. While daggerists might be deadly predators, like earth monkeys, it seems they are sociable, living in troops of one or more families and looking out for each other. After reuniting with its troop, the daggerist goes on the hunt once more, and I get to witness it leaping from a tree and gliding to the ground using sails under its arm, soaring in a manner quite similar to many species of gliding earth animals. The hunt doesn't last long. The daggerist is a brutal hunter, and an animal I should be wary of. On the other edge of the forest, I see a lone grove back that seems to be under attack. The air is filled with a swarm of needle-like predators, which are launching themselves at the titanic groveback from all directions. These are beach quills, and while it seems impossible for these tiny lifeforms to take down such a behemoth, the groveback is clearly affected by their onslaught. I realize the insect-like beach quills must be highly toxic. It might seem strange that tiny organisms like beach quills could be so venomous. But animals like the small, blue-spotted ribbon tail ray are some of the most venomous lifeforms in the oceans, despite their relatively insignificant size. So, it makes sense that a colony of beach quills working in tandem would be able to take down all number of unprepared organisms that wander into their domain. For beach quill territory marks the edge of a new biome, one home to far greater dangers than the forest. Two days into my expedition, I've reached a sea of shifting purple liquid. 
the properties of which are highly mysterious. This landscape appears to be the same ocean I saw from space, which now doesn't seem like an ocean at all. With caution, I take a sample of this strange mass. Looking under a field microscope, I find this ocean isn't made of water molecules, but living cells. The entire ocean is actually a single massive life form, an amoebic sea that blankets 5% of the surface of planet Darwin IV. Looking towards the horizon, I can see this vast colony stretches far into the distance, and is a biome in and of itself. A question grows in my mind. What life forms have evolved to live upon this sentient ocean? A low roar thunders across the sea. The mightiest creatures I will ever witness are approaching. At last, they come into full view. These are Emperor Sea Striders, the largest life forms I've discovered on my voyage, towering over the amoebic sea like living mountains. Without a doubt, these are the creatures the probe first glimpsed that started the entire expedition. But seeing them in person is an entirely different experience. In order to sustain such an awe-inspiring size, the Sea Striders' biology is one of a kind, particularly their feeding system. The Sea Striders possess two mouth-like openings located on their feet, allowing them to feed on the limitless amoebic sea while they stride across it. It's the perfect food source for such a vast life form, and though a storm rages around them, the Emperor sees Striders march on, undaunted. In just a short time, I've seen more wonders than I can count on the surface of Darwin IV, yet I suspect the mysteries of this planet are just beginning. I'll venture farther across Darwin IV in part 2 of this expedition investigating the more extreme and often more dangerous life of the skies and polar regions. And if you have a particular creature you want me to be sure to cover, put it in the comments. If you find the life of Darwin IV as fascinating as I do, I'd encourage you to purchase the book and check out more of Wayne Barlow's incredible work. Once again, links are in the description. And as always, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this entry, please lend your support to help make videos like these possible by liking, subscribing, and hitting the notification icon to stay up to date on all things curious. See you in the next video.